Um, I just want to talk about just the basics of nutrition because we may be on different levels here and we may not all understand nutrition the same way. So I want to start from the very beginning and uh, just take you through nutrition. So this will be a crash course in nutrition science. So what are the three macronutrient classes? This is a really good place to start. And again, I just want to put that question out there. Does anyone know the answer to this one? What are the three macronutrient classes without Googling it? I don't know all three, but aren't carbohydrates one? Carbohydrates, that's good. I'm gonna record this too. I forgot to hit the record button. Is there a record button? I think I am already recording my- Oh, you're recording it. Okay, great. So um, do, do you want a copy of present uh, recording too? That would be excellent. Okay, I will send you over uh, something, okay? Great, thank you. Sure. Okay, so, uh, uh, sorry, I'll pose this question again. Uh, what are the three macronutrient classes? Are the other two um, fats and proteins? Excellent. So we, carbs, fats, and proteins. So that's sort of the basic framework to think about nutrition. So we're going to go a little bit deeper into those three classes. So we have carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. So let's first talk about carbohydrates. So it's really easy to think about uh, simple carbohydrates. We see these every day. It's things like uh, bread, cake, candy, anything with sugar, right? That's, that's the most basic, uh, simple carbohydrate, but also fruit juice, honey, um, pasta, grains, things like that. So these are your simple carbs. And then we have complex carbohydrates, things like whole grains, um, whole fruits, whole vegetables, basically anything in the whole form is going to be a complex carbohydrate. And anything in a process form is going to be a simple carbohydrate. And a really uh, easy rule of thumb, I made this presentation a few years ago when this meme was popular. Uh, a really simple rule of thumb is that if you just try to eat more complex carbs and less simple carbs, uh, that'll help you maintain a proper weight because simple carbs are very, uh, very easy to gain weight when you eat a lot of those. And another class of carbohydrates is known as fibers. Um, fiber can be found in whole fruits and vegetables and also um, in things like oatmeal. And oatmeal is actually a really important example of fiber um, because we know that the soluble fiber in oatmeal actually has a cholesterol lowering property. And so cholesterol is a really common risk factor. Um, if you have high cholesterol, it's a risk factor for things like cardiovascular disease so if you can eat oatmeal, what it does is the fiber actually traps the cholesterol molecules so that when you, uh, you know, excrete the oatmeal, you're actually losing some of the cholesterol too. Your body has to make more and overall your cholesterol levels go down. So uh, in short, the functions of carbohydrates, they provide energy and regulation of blood glucose. They spare the use of proteins for energy. So if you're eating a, an only protein diet, you actually have to use those proteins for energy. Um, but if you're eating some carbohydrates, it can actually help with muscle building because you, your body can focus on using the proteins for building muscle. And then you can use the carbohydrates for as, as an energy source. Um, they're very sweet and they're good for flavor. And the dietary fiber we just mentioned. So that's carbs. Any questions on carbs? I'm going to move on to fats. So can anyone give me some examples of fats, foods with fat in them? Nut butters. Okay, great example, nut butter. Anything dairy. else? Okay, dairy. What else? Avocados. Avocados are a great source of fat. Yeah, so, um, and then there's one more class of food that has a lot of fat. Okay, so I'm seeing in the chat. So Sydney said bacon. So this big class of food we would call meat, right? Okay, and oils is another giant class of fat. Right, so those are the big groups, right? Meats, oils, and uh, we have some fatty, um, fruits and vegetables like avocados. 
So um, when we're thinking about fats, we can sort of classify them as fats coming from animals and fats coming from plants. And is there a big difference between these? That's what we wanna find out. So we can think about the different types of fat. We can categorize them in four classes here. And the way we're gonna name these, you've probably heard these words before, saturated, unsaturated. The reason these are named this way, I don't wanna to go too deep into the chemistry, but um, if you think about an organic chemistry molecule, these carbons are what we, what we call saturated with uh, hydrogens. In other words, every carbon has the maximum amount of hydrogens. Um, every carbon can have four bonds. So this one has one bond to carbon and three hydrogens. Whereas over here in an unsaturated fat, these carbons actually are double bonded to other carbons, which is, in, in other words, they're not saturated with hydrogen molecules. And so because of this saturation and unsaturation, these fats have different properties, both chemical and biochemical in the way that they um, uh, influence our health, right? So you may have noticed that things like butter and coconut oil, um, so coconut oil is kind of an exception, really, when you're thinking about saturated fats, you're thinking about butter, animal fat like lard, um, but coconut oil actually does fall in this saturated category. So they're solid at room temperature, right? So I could have a stick of butter sitting on the counter and it, you know, it'll stay in a solid form, whereas I can't just pour olive oil on the counter, it'll be liquid, right? Um, so monounsaturated fats, the best example is olive oil. And uh, again, it, they have a lower uh, melting point, so they're liquid at room temperature. Polyunsaturated fats, very similar to monounsaturated, um, but different properties on your health. And then we have trans fats, um, which are actually made chemically in industrial processes. And so tr trans fats actually, um, they have a, a partial hydrogenation. So in other words, we're adding hydrogen molecules to fatty, uh, fatty acids. And this gives it a sort of unnatural um, properties that our body doesn't readily recognize. And so that is why trans fats aren't really good, that good for you is because these are made in industry and they're not naturally occurring. So we haven't really evolved to digest them in a proper way. Um, but we use them in a lot of foods because they are stable. In other words, um, you could put trans fats in food products and it will help them to maintain a shelf life for longer. Um, you can't really have food products with like butter in them. Like you can't just have, you know, cereal with butter in it, right? Um, that'll go bad really quickly. So trans fats have a really stable shelf life and that's why they're used. Um, so uh, I don't wanna get into too, too deep of a discussion about saturated versus unsaturated fats, but it's very easy to say that trans fats are bad for you and should be avoided. So some examples of trans fats foods, we have like breakfast pastries, like, you know, little Debbie's cinnamon buns, stuff like that. Uh, things like prepackaged desserts, uh, jerky, crackers, basically anything that's sitting on the shelf in the grocery store for years and years um, is a good example of trans fats. And then also um, fried food can develop trans fats while being fried, but not quite as badly as these other products. So, so yeah, I would say avoid these um, if you can. And this is just a comic about avocados. So uh, what do fats do? Well, they're a concentrated source of energy. Um, in terms of caloric content, one gram of fats has about double the energy of carbohydrates and proteins. Uh, they provide energy, especially if you're a person who's starving, your body is gonna start consuming your fat stores and that's gonna keep you alive. And there's also certain vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, and K which are only fat soluble. And so you need fat in your body to transport these uh, fat soluble vitamins. And fats are also crucial for the formation of cholesterol, which although has a bad reputation is actually necessary for um, cell membranes and also steroidal hormones, things like testosterone, estrogen. Um, and uh, what's the one uh, when you get excited? Um, Dopamine. Uh, dopamine, yeah, um, I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, uh, 
temperature insulation. So, you know, you can think of a big fat bear can survive all winter because he's very fat. And uh, they make food taste better, as you may have noticed. So that's fats. Uh, last class of macronutrients is proteins. What are some examples of proteins? Beans. Okay, beans, great example. Meat. Meat is probably the most common example. Can you think of anything else? Nuts. Nuts, okay. Good, so th those are some big categories. Uh, yeah, so we got our meats, we got our beans, we got our nuts. Um, and some grains like brown rice have a little bit of protein in them too. But mostly we're thinking about beans, meat, and nuts. Good. So what are the functions of proteins? Well, they're crucial for building and repairing tissues, muscles, organs. They're, they can be used as an energy source when you don't have enough carbohydrates to power your body or fats. Um, hormones such as insulin are made of protein. The enzymes that break down uh, things when you're metabolizing food are made of proteins. Transport molecules like hemoglobin that bring oxygen throughout your body through your bloodstream are proteins. And things like antibodies, so your immune system uh, is made of proteins as well. So a lot of really crucial functions of proteins. Uh, so that's proteins. Does anyone have any questions about the three macronutrient classes? Because the next thing I'm going to go into is micronutrients. So uh, so we just talked about macros. So now we'll talk about micronutrients, which are needed in smaller quantities, but they're just as crucial. Um, so things like vitamins, minerals, and also uh, antioxidants and phytochemicals I have here in parentheses because the science isn't exactly settled for what the exact amount of these things that we need it are. But um, we know that vitamins and minerals are definitely crucial and we have things like recommended daily values for those compounds. So we know, for example, we know about how much iron, how much vitamin B um, each person needs every day in order to maximize their health. So micronutrients are also super important. Uh, they're important for cell processes and metabolism. So a lot of enzymes, for example, need vitamins as like a cofactor. Um, they're important for growth and development and uh, things like antioxidants have been shown that they can perhaps prevent cancer. So then the big question becomes, how do you properly combine these macronutrients in a healthy diet? Should I eat only carbs? Should I eat only protein? Should I eat some sort of mix? Um, so this is a question that's been evolving throughout the years, throughout the decades, as nutrition science has evolved. And we used to have this paradigm called the food pyramid, where basically, okay, the, mo the things you eat the most of are bread, cereal, rice, and pasta. And then uh, you can eat, you know, three-ish servings of fruits and vegetables, and a little bit less uh, protein and dairy. And then up here is like fat and sweets. Um, like added fats and sweets. So uh, this is the old paradigm. And from what we know now, we can say that this is completely wrong. Uh, they were recommending people eat something like 11 servings of pasta. I mean, knowing what we know now, this is al almost mind blowing to think that this was the official recommendation for people. Um, and we wonder why we have an obesity epidemic in this country. Well, this is definitely part of the reason. So in 2005, uh, this paradigm was upgraded to something called My Pyramid. Um, and My Pyramid stuck around for a little while. You can see that the ratios of these are sort of uh, uh, demonstrated by the area of this pyramid. But um, what are some things you notice about My Pyramid? And maybe it, I just have a personal, but I, eventually they replaced this. And so there's some obvious problems with this. So it should be obvious what the problems are. Um, maybe some of you see it. It doesn't tell you how much of each. Right. That's the main problem. It, it's super hard to realize, okay, like, you know, should I get my ruler out and try to figure out like, okay, this is like three fifths of the, you know, whatever. 
it, it's very unclear what the quantities of these uh, of these compounds are, right? So, so they got rid of that too. Currently, they're using something called MyPlate, which um, is not perfect, but in terms of comparing it against the food pyramid and uh, my uh, my pyramid, it's way better. Um, so one thing you could see right off the bat is that my plate is really easy to interpret, right? You can just look at this and say, okay, half my plate should be fruits and vegetables, um, quarter protein, quarter grains, optional dairy, right? Super simple. Um, grains have been cut back to the rightful place as a quarter of a plate. You don't have, you know, 60 or 70% of your diet is grains, which is good. Finally, they updated that. And in terms of servings, it's like, well, just go by your plate. You know, if you eat three plates of food a day, you can just do this for each plate. So it's sort of a relative ratio of food rather than saying, okay, everybody needs to eat, you know, 2000 calories or 3000 calories or whatever. So super good, uh, big improvement. And uh, it's really nice compared to the old systems. Um, have any of you ever heard of the ketogenic or Atkins diet, or have any of you, any of you ever uh, experimented with this before? My mom is on the keto diet. Oh, really? Yeah, my mom's on it. And how's, how's that going for them? Is that working out? Good experiences, bad experiences? Yeah, she's lost uh, 60 pounds since, I think, January. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, my mom lost a lot of weight, but also when she stopped doing it, she kind of quickly gained it back. Mm. Yeah, that's a problem. With with many diets, that's a big problem. So, Mike, oh. if you go for keto diet, like uh, what, uh, who, I think it was Sydney, you have to continue on that one or you can basically flip-flop whenever you want because body needs to adjust with diets, right? Oh, were you asking me or Sydney? No, I'm asking you. Oh, uh, well, one thing about carbohydrates is that they retain a lot of water. So one thing people notice when they first go either go on this diet or come off this diet is that they're losing like 10, 15 pounds of just water weight. You know, if you go on a keto diet, you're going to lose uh, maybe 10 pounds right off the bat in the first couple of weeks, but it's mostly water weight. So, um, so that's why, why that will be oh, well, because carbohydrates retain water. Yeah, but I can tell you from my own experience, uh, when I'm fasting every Tuesday from last, I don't know how many years now, boy, so which means basically I'm on one fruit in the morning and then I eat dinner. So basically 12 hours and 10 on top of that, I teach two PhD classes on PhD on Tuesdays. So long story short, like boy, I had to go to restroom for like almost every two hours. And that point in time, since I'm not eating anything except one fruit in the morning, my body is mostly burning fat, right? Mm. Well, it takes actually more than just probably one. It takes about two or three days for your body to go into what's known as ketosis. Oh, okay. So, so you eat um, carbohydrates, but then you still have some sugars circulating in your bloodstream. So to get to ketosis, your body actually has to use all of those sugars that are circulating in your bloodstream. And then your body gradually will switch to a state of ketosis where it starts to look to other sources for fuel. So I need to be on fasting for like three days straight, huh? Well, you don't have to go complete fasting, um, but fasting from carbohydrates. Oh, it's good to just do not eat anything instead of thinking too much about what you're eating, right? <laughs> well, there's a lot of studies that show that a, maybe a two day fast or a three day fast, I don't wanna recommend fasting because it's something that you should know about. You know, you shouldn't just jump into fasting. I don't want anyone to get oh, yeah, that. To be yeah. careful. But um, a two day fast has been shown to be really good for your body in terms of resetting the immune system. Uh, it's good for a lot of autoimmune conditions. My friend cured his psoriasis by just doing uh, uh, some two day fasting uh, every so often, maybe once a season, he would do a two day fast and his skin condition just totally uh, got perfect. Uh, you know, I, I can tell you based on my own experience with fasting. So I used to do it and then I left it in between for uh, like three, four months. And so somehow I started feeling that basically my brain power has gone down once I have left fasting and I'm pretty active on brain size and, you know, and my physical power, mental power is really up to the mark if I actually do fasting on Tuesdays. Mm. So that is why I came, started doing it back. It, you know, because that helps actually overall in terms of mental and physical. 
But yeah. that is my personal experience. I don't know about others. Yeah. Has anyone ever had experience with that? Well, let's talk about the, the keto diet since I think a lot of people were interested in this. So um, in terms of macronutrient distribution, so normal Western diet is about 50% carbs, um, about 15% protein and about 30% fat. So when you're going on a keto diet, the main, pro the main part of it is that you're reducing your carbohydrate intake to about five to 10% of your caloric intake. And that's going to um, allow your body, as I just described, to go into a state of ketosis where it's primarily relying on fat as a source of energy. And so what this does is it allows your body to start tapping into your own fat stores and start to burn those as energy. Whereas if you have carbohydrates circulating in your bloodstream, it will not, uh, it will first, you know, if you eat a, a cookie, your body's going to use that cookie for energy before it starts to actually start burning your, you know, stomach fat or whatever. Right. Um, so that's the gist of it. There's a lot of good data coming out recently that says, and, and a lot of good anecdotal data as well, saying that it can be really useful for losing weight. I think it works for a lot of people. I wouldn't make the blanket claim that it works for everybody, um, but it's definitely worth trying. And I've tried it several times just to see how I feel. And uh, it's definitely a way to lose weight if you cut out carbs from your diet for most people. Great. So that's the crash course in nutrition. So does anyone have any comments or questions about that before I go into the second part of the lecture? You can ask Mike any question. He's the future expert. I will not say expert because still you are doing your PhD, but yeah, you are getting there. Hmm. Um, about the keto diet. Um, yeah. Do you have to like, just from what I've seen since, you know, my own personal experience, my, when my mom stopped, she gained it back. Would you have to like stay on it? Like, forever if you wanted to maintain the weight loss? Well, so there's two components. So there's ketogenic diet and there's also calorie restriction. And so often when people go on a ketogenic diet, they're also unintentionally or intentionally restricting their calories. So for example, if you, if you gave me um, unlimited chicken breast or steak or whatever versus unlimited pasta and said, okay, you have to just eat one of these, I'm gonna, even if I, it looks like I'm eating the same amount, when I'm eating the pasta, it's going to be a lot more calories because um, carbs burn faster. So you end up eating more of them. And, and your body actually, if I start the day eating some carbs, my body's gonna crave more carbs for energy throughout the day. So what, long story short, when people go on the ketogenic diet, they're also unintentionally, I think, restricting their calories. So maybe that's part of, with your mom, maybe she, um, got off the ketogenic diet, but then unintentionally raised the amount of calories she's eating at the same time. Okay. I also but, heard that it, like over the long term, it can be bad for your liver or something, or is that true? Uh, I don't want to say yes or no. The long-term effects of the ketogenic diet aren't well studied. However, I know that people throughout the ages have done just fine eating animal diets. You know, they're still native tribes and Eskimos that eat primarily meat uh, all day, every day, and, and they live to lead healthy lives. So uh, I, I think it also has a lot to do with your genes. Um, if you come from a ancestry that ate a primarily uh, meat heavy diet, that that could um, help you adapt to that sort of ketogenic diet as well. No, I think uh, I also to asked, uh, told you, Mike, uh, you know, last year also, if I remember it right, so many things between there and today. Mm. You know, I have seen those people from India and in India, as you know, most of the people are vegetarian who come to this country and start eating beef and whatnot. They develop cancer right away. Mm. Yeah, that's actually, so not with cancer, but it's the subject of my PI um, has done a study mm. about Indian people because Indian is a really good example of an ancestry that has traditionally ate a vegetarian diet. So when you do that, you actually evolve, the people will evolve in such a way that their um, metabolism of meat is suboptimal, right? Compared, like, compared to a, a culture that eats tons of meat where they're really used to eating it. Because what happens, I mean, if you think about it, a thousand years ago, you know, if you have a, a group of people that everybody eats a lot of meat, like those people who couldn't eat a lot of meat, like they all died. They're, they're already gone. So 
the people who were going to die eating a primarily meat diet in a, in a culture that eats a lot of meat already died. So we've already evolved to the point where we can uh, metabolize that. So, so yeah, so uh, my, my professor was looking at omega threes actually. And so um, omega threes, if you're not eating a lot of meat, you have to synthesize them more. And so people from India actually have a better ability to synthesize omega threes because they don't get as many of them in their diets. Whereas people who eat primarily a uh, meat diet actually lose the ability to synthesize them. So that's going really deep in a tangent. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it's super interesting stuff. I'll be happy to talk more about that um, later. Any other questions about this um, before I move on? Cool. So let's talk about sustainable nutrition. I know you all are interested in the environment and you want to hear, well, how does this relate to me? Why should I care? Right? So the, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN puts out this statement. When I see a big paragraph like this, my eyes sort of glaze over. So what I did was I split it up into bullet points for you guys. So what does the UN say about sustainable nutrition? Well, they say it's protective and respectful of biodiversity and ecosystems, culturally acceptable. In other words, I can't go to Israel and say, hey, I just found this great diet. You just eat bacon every day. And uh, you know that's totally sustainable for you guys. So it has to be culturally acceptable. It has to be accessible. Um, in other words, uh, if you know a type of food is really common in Asia or in Africa, um, you wouldn't want to recommend the same diet for people in you know South America, right? Um, it's economically fair and affordable, nutritionally adequate. Has to be safe, of course. Has to be healthy. And it has to optimize our natural and human resources. So um, we want to, if we have some grasslands, we want to optimize them in terms of food output. In other words, we want to balance the needs of human health, the needs of feeding the population, but also the needs of the environment. Because if we have a food system that destroys the environment, then it's going to work in the short term, but not the long term. So uh, one of the big topics in environmental science, of course, is CO2. So we'll start there. So Anna LaPay uh, wrote this book about maybe 10 or 15 years ago. This sort of set off this movement that we see today uh, called Diet for, the, for a Hot Planet and the climate crisis at the end of your fork and what you can do about it. So her thesis was basically going on a vegetarian diet is good for the environment because animals, um, animal agriculture, produces more carbon dioxide. And so Anna LaPay is actually the daughter of this one, Francis Moore LaPay, who wrote this book in the 1950s, uh, Diet for a Small Planet. Um, so she sort of picked up where her mom let off and applied it to uh, CO2 emissions. So it's a family that writes very famous books about being vegetarian. Um, and, and she has a point. Um, if you're concerned about CO2, there's definitely a point there. Um, agriculture accounts for about 10% of global uh, greenhouse gases. So that's things like uh, not only farming crops, but also uh, farming animals. And if you look at various diets, so this was in the UK, but if you want to measure the CO2 emissions of a diet, what you find is that indeed heavy meat eaters have a higher carbon footprint than uh, vegetarians and vegans have the lowest of all. Have you guys ever seen this before? Is this interesting? Yes. <laughs> yes, you've seen it or yes, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yes to both. Both. Oh, right. Cool. So yeah, I think this is pretty cool. If you're interested in lowering your carbon footprint, you may consider a vegetarian diet. And this is really mind blowing. And this goes back to the first slide where we we're talking about food waste. If food waste uh, was its own country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter. So China, um, in terms of their food waste, has a very large carbon footprint. But uh, sorry, in terms of their, uh, let me back up. This is just their total greenhouse gas output. But if you took all the food waste from all the countries and made it its own country, it would be the third largest country. Right, so this is a huge problem that if we just focused on tackling this problem, 
I think we could really make a big dent in our carbon output. So that's greenhouse gases. Um, so as a individual, there's only so much you could do in terms of changing your diet. Um, but in terms of acting locally, there's actually more you can do in terms of supporting small farms versus big agriculture. So I wanna talk about this and focus on this a little bit too. Uh, I got a question in the chat. Would you say being more conscientious of consumption would be a better option than cutting an entire food group from your diet? Um, well, that's up to you. A lot of people, I mean, I was vegan for several years and I eat meat again today. And I actually, believe it or not, I feel much healthier eating meat. And so it depends on how much personal sacrifice you want to take on. Um, if you are vegan and you feel great, then, and, and you want to help the earth in that way, then that's great. Um, but a lot of these uh, food waste issues are also systemic issues. So unfortunately, what can I do really as an individual to stop you know, McDonald's from wasting so much food. Well, I can tell you guys about it. And maybe one of you grows up to be the CEO of McDonald's or something. You know, what can we really do as individuals? Uh, there's only a limited influence we can have. But but this, this topic right here is actually something we can have more influence on because you're literally voting with your dollars every time you buy food, right? Um, so let's think about monocropping for a second. So this is a really important issue. Monocropping would be growing one plant in the same place year after year. So for example, here's my 100 acres of land and I'm gonna grow only corn, right? But they're uncommon because people quickly figured out that this is not a good thing for the soil and it depletes the nutrients of the soil and you end up having a dead patch of land really quickly. But dual crops are very common nowadays. And so corn and soy is a common dual crop rotation. So, you know, grow some corn, for maybe a year or two, switch to soy, it uses a little bit di different nutrients in the soil. And so actually half of the farm in the United States is this corn and soy duo crop, which is amazing to think about. Um, I took this from a book. I, this is actually a picture I took. I couldn't find this online, but um, this is a really interesting book about sustainability and about monocrops and duo crops uh, called Never Out of Season. And it, it's, if you look at the proportion of calories that people eat from different crops, what you find is that there's about 15 or so species that makes up about 90% of what we eat with rice being about a quarter, wheat being about a quarter. Um, and then all the other 7,000 species of crops makes up only about 10 to 15% of our dietary intake. So why does this matter? Does anyone know why this matters? You know, this is working, right? If it's not broke, don't fix it. Why should I care? Any ideas? What if I give you a hint? Now, does anyone know why this matters? Any ideas? Well, say there was some kind of famine that came and killed all the wheat crop for a year well that's a quarter of that's a quarter of what people subsist on so there's gonna be it's sad to say but there's gonna be a massive die-off exactly right excellent point tucker so that's exactly the point is that if you're focused on only a small handful of species, this species is susceptible to a disease. So we had this happen about 100 years ago in Ireland. It was called the Irish potato famine. And what happened in the year 1850 is about maybe uh, three, two or three million people died in the span of about 10 to 20 years because what had happened is the Irish took potatoes from Central America and brought them to Ireland and they realized, oh, here's a great crop. It can uh, satisfy all my nutritional needs. It tastes good. I can use it versatilely and it grows really easily in the rocky Irish soil. But the problem is that the ecosystem of Ireland is not set up in a way to fend off the natural predators of the potatoes. So when a um, parasite comes in, 
there's no checks and balances. So it just totally obliterates um, all the potatoes. So that's what happened. And that's why monocropping and dual cropping is such a problem is because if we're so reliant on just a few handful of species, um, if, if some kind of uh, pest or uh, bacteria or virus or whatever comes in, then it can quickly kill off those plants and, and that would lead to killing off a lot of people. And this actually happened in Central America about a hundred years ago. If you eat, if you ever eat artificial banana flavor, have you noticed that it doesn't taste how bananas taste? The reason that is, is because this artificial banana flavor is modeled from these gro what are known as gross Michelle bananas, which actually existed, um, I think it was about maybe 1950, I wanna say, maybe a little bit earlier than that. Um, and then a, a disease called Panama disease came in and basically uh, killed the entire strain of these bananas. So now we have a different type of bananas that we eat today. Um, and they taste a little bit different. So that's why the artificial flavoring, uh, they taste like these bananas that we don't have anymore. Hmm. So uh, I, I can see banana quality going down. Uh, is there any disease going on? In uh, currently? Yeah. I don't know. Something is wrong for sure because, uh, you know, I eat banana quite a bit actually everybody in my family loves banana but quality of banana is basically yeah something is wrong for sure mm. it could be too they're just trying to like maximize output and that leads to reduction of qualities oops no i think it's just going down in taste and flavor everything including and plus uh, you keep the banana they never used to go bad in my house like for three four days nowadays you keep them they are bad in one or two days so something is wrong for sure Mm. Bananas, I, I do have, I know a little bit about that, actually. Oh, great. So there um, is a problem, huh? Yeah, so there, it, bananas are one of those fruits that um, don't have seeds, so everything is a clone. And what we're seeing right now is there's this disease um, in our major banana producers that is causing a mass extinction of the current banana population. So... In Tifton, actually, at our other UGA campus, they're doing a genetic breeding program um, to make a better hybrid that's resistant to this disease. I'm not sure exactly what the name is, um, but they've had to do that. I think in the early 2000s, they had to make a new um, hybrid, and our bananas now are not as sweet, and so that's what people notice, but it's going to actually become less, even less sweet once this high, a new hybrid comes out, because that's a trait that's being lost in their crossbreeding program. Mm. Yeah, so basically I had to find some other fruit. Okay. Yeah. Because I told you, because I can see that or you know, feel the difference, especially I eat bananas on Tuesdays when I have not eaten anything else. So I can definitely feel the difference. Okay, good. Thanks, Marin. Interesting point, Marin. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't know about that. So this is a plot of uh, corn uh, by county. And what we can see in this plot is it, relating to the previous point about a, um, a parasite coming in. Um, they are all very highly concentrated in one area of the country. So you can imagine that if some kind of disease came in and affected corn, it would spread very quickly to the centralized location where it's all being grown. So now I don't wanna be too uh, doomsday, but you know, that's just one additional consideration. Okay, um, another phenomena is that we are noticing in the past 50 to 100 years that we have fewer farms and they're getting larger. So since about 1900, the number of farms has become about a third of what it was. And, and likewise, the average farm size has maybe quadrupled. And so there's pros and cons to this. Uh, the pros are that you can reduce your labor demands, you can maximize production. Um, the large farms are providing a lot of food security for our country, it seems to be working, nobody's going hungry. Um, you can improve your animal and plant breeding techniques. If you have all the animals and plants happening in one spot, then you could put the best technique there and sort of optimize it that way. And these GMO crops are more robust. You can have a high yielding uh, GMO crops. Um, I'll talk about GMOs a little bit later. And, but there's also cons. So as we mentioned, there's disease susceptibility of these large farms. Uh, the topsoil is depleted very quickly. 
you can get groundwater contamination and there's definitely a higher risk of pollution. Um, decline of family farms. So you're seeing a, a, a hurting small businesses from this. And, uh, and there's also the greater potential of uh, neglect in terms of farm laborers and also farm animals when you have larger farms. So we already talked about disease susceptibility. Um, let's talk about farm animals now. So this is the average weight of a broiler chicken. Uh, since 1957, we've seen that they've quadrupled in size. And this is due to factory farming and also um, increases in farming technology throughout the years. And I want to talk about factory farm meat because I think this is an important topic that doesn't get as much attention as it deserves. So again, there's pros and cons of factory farm meat. The pros are it's inexpensive, it's automated, um, it's time efficient, very profitable, and you can maximize your food production. But the cons are that um, these animals are not in ideal conditions. Um, the meat is often of poor quality. You can also have health concerns for consumers. For example, if you have you know, a million chickens in this one place, then if one gets sick, a lot of, uh, there's not really a million, but let's say you know, 10,000 chickens, right? If one gets sick, it's gonna spread very quickly and you could be shipping out um, that contaminated meat in a way that wouldn't happen if there was many small farms. And they create a lot of pollution. So um, I wanna show some images of factory farms because like I said, I think this doesn't get enough attention. Um, feel free to not look at your screen if you're very squeamish or sensitive um, for, for the next maybe two or three minutes. So I'm gonna show some, some intense images of factory farming here. Um, so these are pigs. Um, most, if not all, pigs that are farmed that you eat, that you buy pork or bacon in the store, um, they live in what are known as gestation crates. So they essentially can't really even turn around for the entirety of their lives. And they live in this small crate. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's how uh, pork is made. So here's another picture of pigs. So pigs are super smart. The thing with pigs is that a lot of people say they're about as smart as dogs. And you can imagine if dogs were living in this condition that there would be a lot of suffering and we would feel really bad about. So for me, it's always been hard to understand why people, if it was exactly the same thing, but with dogs, but because it's pigs, we don't care because you know they're food or whatever, just something to think about. And uh, these are dairy cows. So um, they don't live their entire lives like this, but this is sort of the mass milking apparatus that they, um, that they go in. Um, so it's a very condensed, uh, all the cows are very close together. Again, we can see how if there was some kind of illness that it would spread very quickly because they're kept in such close quarters. And there's a lot of uh, mechanizing, uh, which can also lead to animal injuries or things like that. And uh, these are layer hens, I believe. Um, so chickens that lay eggs are typically kept in cages like this and they can't spread their wings out. Uh, they can barely stand up and turn around. Again, it's just very distressful conditions for animals. And if you think that animals have consciousness and you care about that, then you know, perhaps you should be concerned about this. Uh, veal is one of the worst um, situations for an animal. So um, these uh, veal calves are fed. They, they don't even give them water actually. Um, what they give them is this sort of like fattening milky substance. So when, whenever they're thirsty, they can't just even drink water. They have to be constantly fattening themselves in this short amount of time. So it's a very cruel situation for these animals. Um, and the, then the less they move, the, the better quality the veal meat is. And uh, this is a foie gras duck. So these ducks are force fed um, in order to fatten and enlarge their livers. And uh, this is considered a French delicacy, this foie gras. And so this is how it happens. So, so hey, you should know where your food comes from. You should know what you're eating. Um, it's only in the past maybe 50 to 100 years that we've had the luxury of being able to eat meat without actually having to get our hands dirty about it. So, you know, is that a good thing or a bad thing for society? 
I don't know, if you ever go hunting or go fishing yourself, um, you can definitely feel that there's a difference there than just going to Kroger and picking up a case of food, right? So it doesn't have to be this way. Um, this guy is Joel Saladin, and he's, you may call him one of the main characters of this really famous book about nutrition called The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael, Michael Pollan. Great read. Uh, Michael Pollan is a great author on nutrition topics. I'll talk about another one of his books in a minute. And Joel Saladin was actually on the Joe Rogan experience um, maybe three or four months ago. So in the time that I've been giving this lecture, this guy has gotten more famous, which is really heartening. And so he runs this place called Polyface Farms, and it's a really simple idea. The idea is that it's you're growing crops and raising animals all in the same uh, all in the same farm. So this is how it basically was done for hundreds of years or thousands of years that you know the animals are fertilizing the crops and the crops are feeding the animals and the chickens are you know supporting the cows and the cows are supporting the chickens and it's sort of this sustainable ecosystem and you rotate on the land it's a lot it's more work and it makes the food a little bit more expensive but it's higher quality and you know that the animals were raised in a sustainable way that's not only good for the animals but also good for the environment um, so what he does so cows eat a lot of grass as you know so what they do is they'll take the cows and basically rotate them throughout the farm um, and then when the cows let's see i think first you put in the chickens and then the chickens come and eat all the bugs and then you rotate the cows in and the cows come and eat all the grass and then it's sort of this road i don't remember exactly but um but it's a really interesting system okay someone says the milk carousel is not inhumane um i i did not say it was inhumane what i said was keeping the animals in close quarters um, increases the spread of uh, the susceptibility of disease spreading. I agree that the milk carousel is not inhumane, um, but some of these other pictures that we saw, for example, the gestation crates for pig, I would argue um, are, you know, you can make an argument that they're inhumane. So yeah, good point, Marin. Um, so I want to talk about uh, GMOs. I didn't do a ton of GMO research, but um, they also have pros and cons. Um, so pros, you can make crops that are pest resistant, um, disease Mike, resistant. Yeah. Sorry to bother you. We are running out of time. We finished at 11.10. Oh, really? 11.10? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, well, wait a second. Oh, my bad. So we started 10.20. We finished at 11.10. Okay. Minutes. Yeah. Let me just wrap it up then. I'm sorry. I'll, sure. I'll finish it right here. Mm -hmm. um, so what can you do to eat more sustainably? Well, Michael Pollan gives us advice, uh, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. This is solid advice. <laughs> Tend your garden. So one of the best things you could do to help the environment is grow your own food. You know exactly where it came from and you know exactly um, what's happening with the soil and, and what's happening there. So um, buy locally, support your local farmers, look your farmers in the eyes. You can see exactly where your food came from and who you're supporting. And support biodiversity, go beyond the 10 to 15 major crops and try things like wild greens and a lot of these uh, exotic fruits and vegetables that can actually be not only delicious, but help the environment as well. And uh, if you are interested in the uh, issues with the animals I just talked about, then free range meat is always an option. Um, not always perfect, but definitely a step in the right direction. Okay, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, sorry, I went over time. And I'll, uh, you're free to go, I think. But if you have any questions, I'll stick around for a few minutes too. Okay, any questions? One question we have time for, and that's it. Anybody? Okay, yeah, Marin, if you have something, yeah, please go ahead and send it to us. More we know, better we are, right? Information is the key here, especially food as such an important topic, and it has such a big impact on carbon and land use, on health, you name everything. It connects everything. Okay, so Mike, thank you so much for your time. As always, it's a very interesting talk and uh, I will be in touch and I will send you the link, okay? Thank you very much. Thanks everybody for listening. Okay, bye. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Thanks.